I'm John Lorden, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Andrea Cipriano, a forensic psychologist and a digital content specialist at Uncovered. I'm Dana Pohl. I'm a librarian, host of the True Crime PI podcast, and head of community at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lorden Arts Uncovered. And today's case is a little bit different. We are covering a case where there's actually a conviction, a case that in one way is considered solved, but is still actively a missing persons case, and it may forever be a missing persons case. It has entries in NamUs, The Charlie Project, and of course, at Uncovered.com. Today's case takes place in several locations in Southern California. Spending the first half of my life living there, I'm very familiar with the beautiful weather, scenic locations, and the influence of the entertainment industry. From the beaches to beautiful mountains, California really brings together many different types of people in a unique way. However, today's story makes a strong case for always being careful about the types of people that you associate with, and even more importantly, being careful about who you trust. I'm pretty thankful to have been raised in Southern California during the 1980s. Today's case takes place around that time and into the 1990s. And as a young John Lorden was in high school, a young woman named Katrina Montgomery was trying to make her start in life. Andrea, Dana, how does this timeline come together and what can you tell us about Katrina? Katrina Montgomery, known as Trina to her family and friends, was the oldest of three children. Her parents say she was the spark of the family. As a child, she was speaking in full sentences and had an aggressive sense of humor. She liked to play jokes on people. Katrina was a headstrong, rebellious, pretty redhead who dreamt of becoming a professional photographer. Katrina met a man named Mitch Sutton, and they began dating in 1989 when she was only 16 years old. Mitch was a founding member of a white supremacist gang called the Skinhead Dogs, based out of Ventura, California. In the following years, Mitch Sutton would enlist in the military, and Katrina moved with him to Germany for eight months. This relationship would not last, though. They ended up breaking up in 1992. Once she returned to California, Trina worked as a waitress at Jerry's Famous Deli near her parents' home in Los Angeles and attended Santa Monica College. Katrina began corresponding with Justin Merriman, a man she had met through her now ex-boyfriend, Mitch. Merriman was a man known for a violent temper, white supremacist tattoos, and a disrespect for women. He had been incarcerated in various juvenile detention facilities early on in his life and was, at the time, in prison. Over time, Merriman began asking for sexually explicit photos of Katrina. Katrina insisted that she wanted to get back together with her ex-boyfriend, Mitch Sutton. However, it somehow became expected that she would be with Merriman when he was released from prison. Trina's close friends knew that she did not want to be involved with Merriman. And shortly after he was released from prison, there was an incident where Merriman forced himself onto Katrina. I just want to try to understand this a little better in terms of how is there some expectation that she's supposed to be in that relationship with him. Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, so not necessarily insight in terms of detail with their relationship, but more in the in the mentality of mob wives. Um, so there's this concept of where if someone is in a dysfunctional relationship dynamic with someone who is quite frankly violent or terrifying, kind of in the way that we see this man is, there's an expectation of ownership in in a gang sense. So this correspondence that they had while he was in prison, him asking for photos, 
that type of thing. In his mind, he would feel entitled to her when he was released. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it does seem strange. You got these guys that are kind of in the same gang. She really wants to be back with one in particular, but obviously that's not happening. Like, I almost wonder if there's some aspect of her just trying to stay in that social circle so that she mm -hmm. could try to get back together with Mitch in some way. But it seems to go beyond that because to the point where, you know, this guy's demanding photos and she's sending pictures into prison for him. Um, I don't know. It just, it really highlights there's some type of control mechanism at play here because you would think that she would be safest when Justin is in prison and wouldn't have to engage with him. If she was, really wasn't interested in, in him, wouldn't have to engage on that front. But there's some other thing at play where she's having to for, for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for, for sharing. I've, I've never heard that before about the kind of mob wife mentality. Um, so what happens from here? So on Thursday, November 26, 1992, Katrina spent Thanksgiving with her family in Los Angeles. At that time, she made tentative plans to see them in Santa Barbara on Saturday, November 28th at her aunt's house, but she would never arrive. We know that on Friday, November 27th, 1992, Katrina attended a house party at the home of a man named Scott Porcho in Oxnard, California. Scott was also a founding member of the Skinhead Dogs. Katrina was invited to spend the night and brought an overnight bag along with her purse. According to court documents, Katrina, who was already intoxicated, drove to the party and was one of the first people to arrive. So I literally lived in this area during this time. My graduating class was 1993. So I'm a junior as this stuff is happening. And I lived in an area that was literally a few streets from the border of Oxnard. Like looking at a map of, of where this happened, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I know that place. Um, what's interesting to me is I do remember there being gang activity when I was young. Uh, we knew about them in high school. There was a couple of local gangs in particular. I remember uh, Colonia was one gang. And I actually lived in an area called El Rio where there was, there was gang activity as well. But um, I wasn't aware of any white supremacist gangs at all. Like I was just, when I started hearing about this story, I was like, it's, I was there, I was in this area and I just, I never heard about any of this. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how big is this? How big was this party? About 15 to 30 gang members attended the party. Some were members of the Skinhead Dogs, while others were part of the Silmar Peckerwood family gang. Many were drinking, some were using LSD and marijuana, and a few fights broke out among the partygoers. Court documents state that Merriman and Katrina were seen together throughout the evening, but the exact nature of their relationship remains unclear. I just want to point out Silmar, not super, super close to Oxnard. Like that's that's a bit of a stretch. So it does seem to be that, I guess, for this white supremacist network, they're kind of pulling people from mm -hmm. different pockets of, of the area and they're all getting mm -hmm. together. Um, okay. Silmar believes. That makes sense. Yeah. So what happens um, at, at this party, Andrea? Yeah, I mean, so going back to what Dana was saying about the exact nature of their relationship being unclear, we see that at this party too. Merriman and Katrina were seen wrestling in one of the bedrooms, and Merriman tried to kiss her, but Katrina told him to stop. She became angry and she started yelling. Porcho saw Katrina lying on the bed, clutching her stomach as if she had been punched. Merriman and other gang members were standing around Katrina. And then another woman at the party named April, who's Scott's wife, took Katrina's keys because she was too intoxicated to drive. Porcho and Merriman exchanged words about the altercation. And then April left the party to drive an unknown partygoer home. Merriman and Porcho continued their argument about the incident in the bedroom. By 2 a.m., most of the guests had left the party. But at some point, 16-year-old Larry Nicasio, a member of the Silmar Peckerwood family, witnessed Merriman say that he wanted to get Katrina as he began to taunt her with a steak knife. Merriman told Nicasio, We've, we're going to get that B. You're going to do it. Nicasio assumed that Merriman was joking. Nicasio's cousin, Ryan Bush, also witnessed this interaction between Merriman and Katrina. Porcho, in an effort to break up the commotion, hit Merriman with a 40-ounce beer bottle, and the fight ended. So 
there's a lot of weird dynamics going on here. We have her now being physically assaulted um, and still not leaving, still staying, staying around this. And now we're getting some sense of maybe some of the control mechanisms like, okay, physical violence is certainly part of what's going on here. It's interesting to me that Justin Merriman is talking to Nicasio and his cousin, Ryan Bush, and basically saying, you guys are going to take care of her. Um, which is kind of strange. And I understand there's a bit of an age difference. Uh, essentially, the cousins are around 16 and uh, Merriman's a little bit older. I think he's edging into his his early 20s around here. Mm -hmm. um, and from some things I've read about this case, it looks like uh, Nicasio and Bush kind of wanted to please the older gang members. They kind of looked up to them as almost like older brother figures. So uh, maybe that's what Merriman's kind of leaning on, knowing that he can get these these young guys to do something like that. But this situation is ridiculous. I mean, to the point where you have the homeowner, Scott Porcho, come and have to hit this guy with a bottle. I mean, kick him out of your house. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, it actually takes Scott's wife, April, it takes her showing back up for that to happen. In the midst of the chaos, April arrived home and demanded that Merriman, Nicasio, and Bush go home. April told Katrina to stay overnight with them so that she wouldn't leave with the guys. A short time later, though, Merriman called Katrina and April hung up the phone. This totally upset Katrina, and she accused April and Porcho of trying to run her life. The argument lasted for about 30 minutes, and ultimately, Katrina demanded her keys back. By the way, I don't I don't think it's strange for Katrina to have a reaction like this. I mean, if, if we are talking about this social context that she's in where she's being controlled by these varying forces and now she's kind of in this situation and someone's got her car keys and they want her to stay, it, despite the fact that it I, it seems like April is trying to be helpful here and really keep Katrina out of a bad situation. But. This is someone that has been controlled for years at this point, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's kind of her emotional pain spot. And she's bringing it up and kind of lashing out at them about it. Like, hey, I'm tired of being controlled by everybody. Right. And to think she also snaps too, right after Merriman calls, but someone else hangs up the phone for her. Yeah. So it's that she can't even make that decision. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I'm sure there's her own thoughts going through her head of, well, she needs to call him back or get to him in some way. Right. So, right. so after she does get her keys back, um, Scott and April assumed that Katrina would return to her home in Los Angeles, but instead she drives to Merriman's home. And this was the last time that April would ever speak to Katrina. Katrina arrived at Merriman's home and wanted to go to bed. Merriman forced her to have sex with him. Nicasio and Bush were in the room, which made Katrina uncomfortable, but Merriman didn't care. Court records state that Nicasio and Bush could tell that Merriman was hurting Katrina and that she wanted him to stop. She said she didn't want to get pregnant. No didn't mean no to Merriman, and suddenly he became angry and violent. Katrina ends up getting up to go to the bathroom, and in that moment, Merriman stabbed her in the neck with a knife. Merriman proceeded to attack her covering her in a blanket before grabbing a wrench and hitting her in the head. She did not die immediately and was reportedly begging him to stop. Nicasio wanted to leave, but Merriman threatened him as well. Nicasio also suggested that they seek medical attention for Katrina, but Merriman was concerned that she would rat on him about the incident. Now, this, first of all, is disgusting and terrible. Um, but we have to keep in mind, we're weaving together some information from court documents as well. So we're kind of hearing some of the rationale from Nicasio in particular, like, you know, oh, he wanted to leave. Hey, we should get her to medical attention. But I got to tell you, the description that I'm hearing about this attack doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm someone that's always very keyed into the physical aspects of what's happening. They're in a bedroom. They're in, he's living with his mom. There's literally four people in his bedroom. The two guys are supposedly lying on the floor, sleeping on the floor, and he's in the bed with Katrina when all this is happening. 
the other detail we kind of left out on this version of the script, but I think just speaks to his character is she wanted to get up and go use the bathroom and he didn't even want to let her out of the room. He said, you could use the, the trash can right there instead. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, she's just being demeaned in so many ways. It is, it's ridiculous. And uh, I don't know, just this thought that, Oh yeah, there's a couple of guys in there. No one's stepping up to do anything. Yes, I get they're 16. I get that this guy's 20. In in terms of social dynamics, that's a very big difference. And we know these guys look up to to this guy for some reason, which I don't quite understand. But um it just it seems to me like someone needed to step up in this situation. And if you're not going to, then you're basically participating in it. And honestly, all the men that were in that room are monsters at this point. Like if no one's going to step up and actually be a man in this situation, um, I don't, I don't get it. So what, where does it go from here? So according to court documents, Merriman, Bush and Nicasio go to a house on Carlsbad street, uh, where known members of the Silmar gang reside. Bush entered the house and grabbed paint thinner and rags. He put them in a truck and drove off while Merriman and Nicasio followed. Justin Merriman was actually living with his mother at this time, and his mother witnessed Bush and Merriman take Katrina's body out to her truck, but promised she wouldn't say anything. What kind of family is this? This is insane. I also, I, I just wanted to point out that um, the paint thinner and the rags were basically to wipe their prints off everything that they were doing. There is so yeah. much planning going on with this. And Justin Merriman's house is not close to where the party is. I'm wondering if those three guys are sitting in the car for the nearly 90 minute or two hour drive to get back to his house, working up a plan for, Hey, next time Katrina's around, you know what we're going to do? We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll do, cause this is all of a sudden being executed like a, a well-coordinated plan across multiple people. This isn't mm -hmm. just one guy that thought up, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do, there's multiple people doing different steps. I'm going to go get the paint thinner. I'm going to go borrow another friend's truck. Like there is all kinds of coordination um, mm -hmm. that is coming along with this. So I'm, I'm really just, when it comes to the other two and how much of a role they played, I personally, mm. I just don't feel like we really know the extent of it. I, it, I don't think that came out in, in the yeah, court case. I agree. And I mean, I think what sticks out to me the most is the fact that you, there's technically two weapons that we learn about in the crime scene moment where you have this knife. And first of all, we don't know if it's similar to a kitchen knife, like one that was brandished at the party, or if this is like a pocket knife or something like that, but it doesn't quite matter. The fact that there is one weapon there and then we're talking about this wrench. I don't know who keeps a wrench in their bedroom <laughs> or what, like where you get a blunt object like that, unless you're thinking of having one with you. Right. So, and to think that if Merriman himself had both of those, why would he? Because if he just had the knife, he would know that that would essentially work, right? Why get another object? Yeah. Well, and I'm still caught up on this whole thing. You know, you don't throw a blanket over someone and it magically stays there and holds them down, especially someone that has been traumatized to the point where they've literally just been stabbed in the neck and you think you're going to throw a blanket over them and it's just going to stay there while you go and you pick up your wrench and then come back and hit them. Like it's, it makes a lot more sense to me logically to think there was some form of plan, a second person threw the blanket over her while the first person grabbed the weapon. And then you would have to keep it there because what's the point of the blanket? They're trying to minimize blood splatter and other evidence that could be happening. So it just, th there's, there's a level of coordination here. This is not even, you know, we look into a lot of cases where it seems like there is something that happens in a moment that maybe was not premeditated. This is not one of those cases. This is like, planning, 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 like it's, it's written mm -hmm. all over this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how you point all of this back at one person in particular, I don't know, this, this case is seriously, it's unbelievable. It is. And I find it 
very interesting that instead of going to a store, I mean, they're so planned. They know who happens to have the paint thinner in their garage and where they can pick it up. Um, you know, that kind of rocks me a little bit. Like, has this been done before? Is this the common? Is that the guy you go to when you need it? Um, so there's a lot of questions there. Right. So, but the official story, right, Dana, is that Merriman, Bush and Nicasio devised a plan. So after the fact, they they did all this planning and came up with it. What was part of, of that plan? What did they do? They devised a plan to dispose of Katrina's body and her truck. They placed the knife and wrench in a plastic bag along with some of her possessions. Merriman and Bush carried Katrina's body to her truck. Merriman and Nicasio drove Katrina's truck while Bush rode in another gang member's car. So they drove to Sunset Farms dragged her body into a drainage pipe and covered her with garbage and tumbleweeds. Next, they drove to Angeles Crest National Forest to dispose of Katrina's truck off of a remote dirt road. They saw blood in the truck and attempted to clean it. Bush tried to roll the truck down an embankment, but the vehicle got stuck. They got back in the other truck and went to a Denny's restaurant to figure out what to do next. Mm, man. It just blows my mind, you know, like, especially going to Denny's, like for us, yeah. that was such a high school thing. Like, you know, after mm -hmm. the the play that we did or something, we'd all, we'd all go to Denny's and hang out just to hear that a bunch of guys just murdered a woman. Yeah. Oh, we dropped it. Let's go. Let's go hang out at Denny's. It's, mm -hmm. Let's go get a moons over my hammy or whatever it was it, called. Yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't, it's awful. I mean, it's to terrible. have, yeah, no thought of what you just did and be you know, thinking that you're hungry. It just, right. it blows my mind. Yep. Um, so this is the path from the party to Justin's house. Justin apparently lives out in Bakersfield uh, in his mom's house. That's 122 miles away. That's a two hour drive. So that's where she wound up going as well, based on what I understand Driving about this wrong. case. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and then... Swinging back from Bakersfield to where they dump her body is about 90 miles. And that's uh, close to the Silmar area. That's this, uh, what was the name of the place again? The um, um, Sunset, Sunset Farms. Sunset Farms, yeah. So Sunset Farms is at this intersection of Balboa and Foothill Boulevard. And then there is an entry point into the Angeles National Forest. I don't know if they would have done it kind of on this backside, this is a really large area, or if they drove further out, um, you know, if, if they're trying to separate her from her vehicle, I would think that they probably went further out uh, this way, but this is the general area that we're, we're looking at around all this and just a ton of travel, man, it is, I, I wish that they would have gotten pulled over on that drive. Can you imagine trying to explain that? what is the topography like there is it very is it desert and dry or and hilly or parts of this no? yeah parts of this are but there's also uh what's known as the grapevine uh which you would have had to drive through and kind of gorman uh so there's a lot there's a lot of mountains and quite honestly even this path that they're taking like it's a bit of a question to me why they're coming all this way back to to get rid of the stuff out there outside of yeah obviously they want to get it away from his house i get that but there's mm -hmm. so many vast open areas here where there's just nothing mm -hmm. like there's look at this there's there's no buildings there's no i mean yeah some of these areas have communities that have been built out but california city like there's just there's these areas out here that don't have much of anything they're actually coming back into like the population for california here's los angeles so the population, like if you think of it as a heat map, this one is super, super thick. And then as it branches out from here, you know, it lightens up a little bit. But this whole area right in here, very densely populated. So they're getting right back into the edge of where all that population is. The only thing I could think of about them coming here is they had that, res you know, the resources of their buddies in the other mm -hmm. gang that were in Silmar. And maybe for some reason they knew about that area. Mm -hmm. and knew that that area i mean who knows like possibly that's an area where they dumped other things yeah related to crimes there's something about this area that made them come all the way back for that that uh 
I haven't run into in, in terms of reviewing this case. I, I don't have a good understanding of why they did that. Yeah, weird. Oh, so what happens from here, Dana? Per court records, Nicasio claimed he never touched Katrina's body. On November 30th, 1992, Bush and Nicasio apparently returned to where she was buried and moved her body approximately five feet from its original location. Okay, so that sounds very strange, going back to, to move it five feet. We'll, we'll get into that more later. This whole thing that he's never touched her body, like you're one of two guys that's out there to move a body, even if it is only five feet, and what you told your cousin to do it all on his own, like... I don't know. I don't know. There's aspects of this story that just stick out bizarrely. Um, at least, can you please tell me that these guys aren't like some type of criminal genius and that the authorities are all over them in this case? They are all over them very quickly. On November 28th, 1992, Katrina's dark blue 1986 Toyota pickup truck was found over an embankment in the Angeles Crest Forest by the La Crescenta Sheriff's Office. The truck was off the road on a dirt turnout. There was no sign of Katrina's personal effects inside the car. Around 3 p.m. on November 28th, Catherine Montgomery, Katrina's mom, receives a phone call from the La Crescenta Sheriff's Office telling her about the discovery of Katrina's Toyota pickup truck. They also tell her that blood was found on the truck bed and tailgate area. Police later determined that the blood found inside Katrina's car could not be positively identified, but the analysis showed that it was the blood of a biological child belonging to Katrina's parents. Catherine is worried and starts calling Katrina's friends, trying to locate her. Then at approximately 7 p.m. on Saturday the 28th, Catherine receives a call from Scott Porcho asking if Katrina was there. Catherine informed Porcho about the calls from police, and Porcho told Catherine he hadn't seen Katrina for several months. Oh, I thought we were about to have a hero in this situation. And we have him call because obviously he's concerned about her. He knows where she was headed. But then he lies about seeing her the previous mm -hmm. day. Yeah, it's it's crazy, honestly. But unfortunately, he wouldn't be the only person to lie to the Montgomery family. Catherine later called Scott's wife, April, who also informed Catherine that she hadn't spoken to Katrina in a few months. Catherine proceeded to call around to Katrina's other friends, and it's eventually revealed that Katrina was with the Porchos on Friday night. Great. And now, because of their lies, we have the investigators and her family thinking that they could be involved. We do, but they come around quickly to it. Scott's wife, April, told Catherine that she lied because she didn't want Catherine to think they did anything bad to Katrina. We mentioned earlier that the family had plans to meet at Catherine's sister's house in Santa Barbara on the 28th. Catherine called her sister to find out if Katrina was there. Her sister confirmed that Katrina never showed up. Police were now considering a possible foul play scenario. I would hope so. I mean, we've got the vehicle, the blood, they've traced where she went to. We've got potential witnesses. I know that nobody homicide prosecutions were probably not nearly as common back then, but sounds like we've got the basics of a decent case here. We do, but it takes some time. In July of 1997, reportedly after April had left Porcho and spoke directly to prosecutors, the district attorney's office decided to investigate Katrina's case further. By November of that year, a grand jury was reviewing the case, and Ryan Bush and Larry Nicasio were arrested on suspicion of murder. Bush was later charged with a drug offense, and Nicasio was charged with murder in connection to Katrina Montgomery. Well, they definitely deserve some charges. It's just weird to me that they would have... I mean, I guess unless they're trying to pick on kind of the low guys first to get the big guy. What about what about Merriman? The two cousins would eventually play a role in bringing in Justin Merriman. Ryan Bush originally declined to assist the investigation, but then he changed his mind. Larry Nicasio also finally agreed to cooperate with the police. 
and even signed a plea deal. He agreed to lead them to where Katrina's body was buried. However, when authorities arrived to search the location, they were unable to, to find her remains. Why? Why couldn't they find her remains? Unfortunately, the land where she was buried had been developed on top of. Oh, great. So we've got all these pieces, almost enough for a successful prosecution, but they still don't have her body. Right. They came up with another way to try to secure a conviction by having Nicasio wear a wire while speaking with Merriman. So in January of 1999, Justin Merriman was indicted on multiple charges, including evading arrest after a standoff with police in 1998, two unrelated rape charges from the mid-90s, and the rape and murder of Katrina Montgomery. In 2001, the trial finally happened and Justin Merriman was found guilty of first-degree murder, rape, conspiracy, and witness intimidation, and he was sentenced to death. He's one of only 17 people on death row in Ventura County. And he wasn't the only one to receive charges. Merriman's mother, 53-year-old Beverly Sue Merriman, ultimately pled guilty to two counts of conspiracy. Oh, thank goodness. I'm glad she got some charges as well. I do not understand how you can support your son doing something like that. Like seeing them carrying out a woman. Are you, are you kidding me? I, I just... I'm always shocked by it. And we've we've been hearing about this kind of even recently in terms of the Brian Laundry situation, family covering up criminals, criminal acts. Uh, I just wanted to ask you ladies about this a little bit. I, I don't understand it. I don't have children. I don't have that thing. Like I understand that, you know, you want to protect your family, but um, I don't know. I don't know when it comes to this. Do you have some insights on that you can share with us, Dana? So, yes, I am the mother of two boys, and um, I'm not going to lie. I've thought about this before, not that they would commit these types of acts, but, you know, when they're growing up and they're making poor choices, you often think, I would hate to be put in a situation where I need to, you know, call the police on my child. Um, and having gone through their lives, luckily, without having that experience, but knowing that for me... I would not be able to, if I saw my son carrying a body out of the house, I would never be able to not tell the truth. I would never be able to choose protecting them over justice. Um, and I believe that that is, you know, a, it, it's a difficult decision, but it is absolutely the right decision for me. I would hope that it would be for others, but in this case, obviously it wasn't. And I'm glad that justice has been served. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. shouldn't something like trigger within you about thinking like they're not going to stop doing this? Like if they get away with mm -hmm. this one, they're not going to stop doing this. And what's going to happen? Like, are they going to wind up in a police shootout? Are they going to become a serial killer? Like there's so many, where is the good outcome for mm -hmm. helping protect them in that situation? I just, mm -hmm. I don't understand. Andrea, you have any insight on that? Yeah. Well, I think psychologically there's, there's two main things that I think of. The first one being that Quite simply, for some parents, the thought of losing their own child on top of whatever was happening with the crime is probably more painful than actually assisting with justice, that they would rather take the side of their kid um, because they they don't want to lose them also. Um, and I think there's also so there's that level of it of just wanting to keep your family still intact. And then the other side could be fear. And I feel like that may be part of what's going on with in Beverly's situation with her son. Um, we know that when he was looking to, uh, when Justin Merriman was looking to get the names of the people who ratted on him in the situation, he enlisted his mom's help. And, you know, there's that type of relationship. It could be fear-based that she sees what her son is capable of, is willing to help him so that she doesn't get in trouble Ultimately, obviously, it does get her in trouble, but it's possible in the moment it was just genuinely being afraid of her son. Well, and just despite it getting her in trouble, she doesn't apparently learn any lesson. She winds up testifying at at his case and makes up this story about a uh, I think they were saying a, a bald white guy that apparently was right outside the window and that she saw him out there. <laughs> And like, that's the big reasoning for what really happened to Katrina. Mm -hmm. No, it was this other guy that was right outside the window. And 
<laughs> the prosecutors kind of took her apart because I guess they gave her a diagram and they're like, well, what did the guy look like? What did his face look like? She's like, I told you, I didn't see his face. I only saw his back and it was just a, a bald white guy. And they're like, yeah, but on the diagram you drew, you should have been able to see his face because like you're literally, you're here, he's here. And then she's uh -huh. like, oh, well, I had the whole diagram backwards. Like I just had the whole house turned backwards in my mind. Um, yeah, it seems like she unfortunately probably didn't learn her lesson from that. And ultimately... I think in terms of the Brian laundry case, and I don't want to go too far off the rails here, but I think there's a very good chance that if his parents had information and if they would have rolled that over, that he would have been locked up fairly quickly. And there's a really good chance he'd still be alive right now. Um, so it's just one of those things. You never know how those situations are going to spin and not doing the right thing. I just, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's really, it is hard to be a parent and it's even harder to do the right thing. Your tendency is to want to protect your child, to give them what they need to, you know, kind of a lot of parents give in to what their child wants or their behaviors. And I think that, you know, strong parenting would eliminate this type of behavior. She would not need to fear her son if she wasn't, you know, giving in to him or if she had set expectations for him that were a little bit different, then yes, you can tell me what to do and I'll be ready to do it. There's no good thing that comes from you fearing what your child is going to do. That's no. obviously a huge problem. And I think that plays a role here. And I think mm. people don't understand that there's a path. There's a path through things in some way, you know, like, yeah, maybe it's not going to be the mm -hmm. outcome that you're hoping for, for your son or a daughter. But when they get to the other side, there'll be a level of understanding. There'll be other opportunities. Opportunities. Maybe they'll avoid situations that they wouldn't mm -hmm. have avoided previously. Like yeah. people get so freaked out and I think they just want to freeze time and like, I don't mm -hmm. want anything to change. I want it to be just like it is right now. It's not going to be when you're involved in a situation like that. So you got to kind of get your head on straight and just be like, okay, there's no stopping this from happening. We have to go through it. And how can we make the best as we do? Um, which is a big part of the reason why I wanted to talk about this case today. We have Katrina's family still waiting and still having to go through this. I know I've heard uh, a lot of people in other similar situations be interviewed and talk about, yeah, they got their conviction, but they still don't have the remains of their loved one. They still haven't brought them home. And they're, they're waiting years and years later. Uh, Katrina's remains have never been discovered. Her case is still considered a no-body homicide. And that's honestly one of the aspects. I mean, this case is full of unsettling aspects, but that one really bothers me. This woman was treated so badly and then forever hidden from her family. It's literally like a tragedy on top of this tragedy. Her family never gets to bring her remains home and lay her to rest. And it kind of bothered me so much. I wanted to see if there was any chance, like, you know, it's, it's never too late if we're talking about recovering remains. Maybe there's some new form of technology that could help or some other information out there that could make this a reality. That's why we're doing today's episode. I'm kind of hoping maybe there's a tip out there that can help with this, but we have to understand more about the details, right? So we mentioned that Bush and Nicasio went back to Sunset Farms to move her remains and they reportedly moved them five feet. Why would anyone do that? I went through more old articles about the case. We told you that the cousins actually went there and they put her initially in a drainage pipe that they then covered her with trash. Uh, they went back two days later um, and buried her. So that's why it was only five feet. They literally just took her out of the drainage pipe. But what's interesting to me is thinking, do drainage pipe locations change that much? Probably not. I think that's a pretty strong marker of where her body would have been at the time. And I would think that's something that law enforcement probably have noted and, mm -hmm. and have a, a decent fix on in, in terms of location. But then, you know, the land's been developed. What, what has happened in terms of it being developed? I looked back at some old articles talking about the details on that, and they described it during the trial as basically they went to look for her body and it had been paved over. The area had been paved over and they simply couldn't find her. So 
it kind of depends. I don't know how much the dirt would be processed before pavement would be added to it. I don't know if they bring in, you know, a, like a backhoe and like bust all of that up or grind it up, pack it down before the, the road gets laid on top of it. But the first thing that springs to my mind is like if they had a decent idea of the location based on where that drainage pipe was at some point, and there's got to be records of that drainage pipe being built, like they've, they've got that somewhere. Could they do core samples on that area? Could they possibly use ground penetrating radar? And that kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of would it even work? Like does GPR work on pavement? And apparently there are several types of pavement it does work with. There's some that get tricky, but uh, a lot of types of pavement it will actually work with. It'll even work with concrete uh, in some cases. So to me, it was all of this big question in my mind about like, isn't there more that could be done at now at, at this point to give this family some shot, some hope? Um, so I kept looking and ran into this article over at lamagazine.com just about what happened to Sunset Farms in Silmar? This was written in 2017. From the 1940s to the 1990s, the 262-acre ranch at Foothill and Balboa hosted endless Rotary Club fiestas and hillbilly hoedowns. There was swimming and horseback riding. Today, it's home to a potato chip factory, hundreds of condos, and concrete warehouses. And this is kind of where my heart broke, because that sounds like a lot of significant development. That's much more than, you know, when the court trial was happening and they're like, oh, it's been paved over. Yeah. But now it's been developed heavily on like when you're laying in buildings like this, they've got plumbing, they've got electrical. Sometimes they'll dig down if they're going to build underground parking or something like that. Um, this is the area now we can see the Frito-Lay building here. It's just, it's a bunch of very large industrial buildings that have been built up all around this. Um, I mean, that's the view that's, that's so heartbreaking to me thinking about this. Cause you're right. Like just having it be paved over. Okay. Maybe you could take a couple pieces of pavement out again, doing yeah. the ground penetrating radar. Like that all sounds worthy of investment. Right. And then looking at the satellite imaging, it's like, ugh. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like they, they started building a city on top of this thing. I mean, this area yeah. has just been completely developed out. I mean, there are pockets and, and like I said, we don't know where that drainage pipe is, but, um, you know, built on how big and how wide this area is, there is 60% of it. It looks like that has been hard developed on and all these roads kind of cut in here. I mean, I, I just don't know. I don't know if it's feasible or not, but I just kind of wanted to put it out there. The other thing I'm hoping is maybe, maybe there's some chance that the real location has actually not been given up because there's a level of premeditation that I saw throughout this story thinking if it wasn't just Justin doing all this and intimidating these two cousins into, into doing their part. If there was more planning and premeditation going on with this, these were a group of men that were smart enough to try to separate her from her vehicle. Could they have added this additional ruse in case one of them ever got blamed for it? Like, hey, guys, if anyone picks you up, you say that this is where we went because they're not going to find the body. And if they're not going to find the body, they're not going to be able to prosecute any of us. I mean, I, I think especially back then, like nowadays, no, no body homicide prosecutions are, are pretty well known. Um, but back then, I don't think that level of understanding was quite out there. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. Is there some possibility that maybe Nicasio didn't actually provide the proper location? The defense attorney in Merriman's trial even clearly stated that the case against Merriman came down to believing Nicasio. And it's it's basically down to his words that, you know, hey, this is where we took her. Um, I didn't see any information. Did you run in, into any information about Ryan Bush talking about the location or trying to take them out there? Like we had two guys that were out there. Why is only one of them trying to lead them to the location? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Nicasio is definitely in some ways like the epicenter of how all of this, the the dialogue and the the narrative of the story starts. It's right. him. Right. And if there 
if the questions I have about how this played out and maybe the level of involvement from the cousins was different, if they were actually more engaged in the actual attack, is there some reason why they wouldn't want her body to be found? Why it would actually benefit them to, uh, to give a bad location? I think it's a possibility. It's, it seems like more of a possibility than believing that these two guys just laid on the floor while this woman was brutally attacked and had nothing to do with it. So that's kind of where I'm left with this. Maybe there is a tip out there. Maybe there is someone that has some other piece of this or, or understands something that can help bring her home. What is clear is Katrina did not deserve this. And her family, they don't deserve having an empty seat and a bunch of hard feelings that roll around every Thanksgiving. If you have information about Katrina Montgomery's case, please contact the LAPD at 213-996-1800. Just want to give a big thank you to the LA Times, NamUs, Dateline, Ventura County Star, the Oxnard Star Free Press, the Charlie Project, Medium.com, the Department of Justice, the Supreme Court, and the podcast, The Housewives of True Crime. If you're looking for a space to meet like-minded true crime enthusiasts and advocates while also engaging in case discussions, look no further than the Uncovered community. We even have a space in the community completely dedicated to this series with John Lorden, where we discuss the cases we've covered in each episode. Regardless of whether you join our community or not, you still have access to the Uncovered database, where you can see all of our sources and a full timeline of Katrina's case. If you want to support the work we do, check out Uncovered's merch. You can find links in the description box below. Thank you to my co-hosts on today's show, Andrea Cipriano and Dana Pohl. Please join us again in two weeks as we look into yet another mystery that deserves to be uncovered.